and welcome everybody. Welcome to, what is this, July? <laughs> what is <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to July's webinar. Man, time flies, doesn't it? Yeah, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Well, um, yeah, it's exciting to be here with you all today. Let's, uh, I see the people are streaming in. We'll give it a minute or two. Uh, but uh, would love for you to put in the chat where you're connecting from, just so we can see where all around the country or world uh, we have people chiming in from. But welcome to Andre and Charles and Chris and Daniel and David and David and Harry and Jay and Jim and Karen and Nick and Phil and Richard and there's a lot of names. So, um, yeah. so far we've got Ohio and Salt Lake City, uh, Boise. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Connecticut, uh, Milford, Connecticut two in Connecticut, right on. Um, Atlanta, Georgia, fantastic. All right, well, welcome everyone again. Um, my name is Paul Van Meter. I'm one of the founders of ProShop. I used to be a machine shop owner, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, today we are talking about connecting your office and shop seamlessly together. Um, and I'm pleased to be joined with, by Brian. So Brian, you wanna say hello and introduce yourself? Yeah, Brian, I've, uh, I've actually been a machinist my entire career. I've, I've worked with this fellow, Paul, for, gosh, what, 21 years now, I guess? Yeah, <laughs> so, a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, as a machinist, I've got to, to, to work with the office and really understand what it means to have a, a real meaningful connection. So, um, you know, hopefully kind of between the two of us, we'll be able to, to, to cover a lot of different aspects of, of today's topic. Right on. And do you want to cover the housekeeping items, Brian? Yeah, yeah, thanks. So um, we have a chat. So as, as Paul mentioned, if you want to throw in just a, a quick hello, tell us where you're coming from, that'd be great. Um, there's also a Q&A section on the Zoom meeting. So if you have any specific questions for us, uh, throw them in the Q&A. It's uh, pretty easy for us to manage that. And we'll try to get to those uh, if it's pertinent to the topic at hand. Uh, we'll try to answer it right away. Otherwise, we'll probably keep most of them till the end of the session today and answer them at that point. Um, and then any other thing that you'd like, uh, you know, again, just just let us know. We will be sending out some uh, some of the links and stuff that we'll be talking about uh, at, you know, at the end of the session. So you can grab them out of the chat if we throw them in or you can expect them in an email later on. Right on. Well, let's get into it then. Thanks, Brian. So we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, communication, building trust, how the value stream actually works in terms of where where communication really needs to happen at different phases, um, some of the differences between paperless and and uh, and non-paperless environments, and some of the pain points that causes. And then at the end, we'll get into sort of how ProShop can help to connect your office and shop more seamlessly. So we're going to start with just actually a little tiny bit of history um, about hey, the company. Yeah, uh, you're not sharing your screen yet. Oh, geez. <laughs> that is an oversight. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for saying that. I'm so sorry. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> OK, there we go. That is the intro slide. Um, that's <laughs> me and Brian. Brian now has a big, big mountain man beard, but uh, that's still him. This is what we're talking about today. Communication, building trust. The value stream, digital, paperless, paper environments, and then how ProShop can help. So um, we'll start with a little bit of history of the company. So um, some of you may already know this, others may not, but um, our software company actually originally kind of started as a machine shop. So my partners and I started a company called ProCNC back in 1997, straight out of college. That was our first tiny little 2,000 square foot bay in a steel building. And we started uh, growing the company, um, and we started using Excel, and uh, we made pretty cool uh, little worksheets and workbooks that had visual basic macros for, to, to get, get us all the information, actually, that we, we wanted. And this actually, it's, it's funny talking about this topic today, Brian. You know, we were doing, we were trying to bridge that gap back in, you know, 97 with Excel right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and we put in all the notes from the office so the shop people could see it they could put information back into it for us in the office to see it um but ultimately that that tool became too weak and uh, it just wasn't going to scale with us so we started developing uh this thing that we called pro shop we um 
we looked at software out on the market and those softwares just weren't going to cut it for us. They just weren't aligned with the, the things that we wanted to do as a job shop. Um, they definitely didn't share information very well. So we hired a developer and started building this thing that eventually turned into ProShop. We grew a bunch over the next several years. Uh, and I, I definitely think of ProShop as some of the, sort of the backbone of that growth and allowing us to scale and have things be smooth and relatively easy, although running a machine shop is never easy. <laughs> um, and we just plugged away for a while. And then in 2008, our biggest machine shop customer approached us and asked us to sell ProShop to them. So um, we were reluctant at first, um, I'd say, but uh, after some discussions, we decided to give it a shot. It went so incredibly well for them, um, partly because of open communication, that it just allowed them to uh, really improve a huge amount of their, their company. And they uh, kind of blew us all away. So they started referring us to other shops. We did that a couple more times, and then we realized that we had a bigger opportunity in software. So we sold our machine shop uh, and went into software and opened up ProShop in 2016. So that's a little snapshot of what we looked like at the time. Um, much bigger than this little 2,000 square foot steel warehouse we started with. So when we're talking about um, opening up communication and connecting the shop in the office, what we're really talking about is having a, a free flowing information flow both directions and really open communication. Um, it's, it's remarkable how many companies we talk to have a lot of kind of siloed data. I think it's true in any, in lots of companies, you know, siloed data, people that know something that other people don't know. Um, and that causes all sorts of problems. And so with, with a better flow of information, you know, people can make the right decisions uh, more easily. They, uh, it reduces interruptions by not having to go seek out data, uh, you know, walk the floor to find something. Um, when people out on the shop have everything they need uh, that was delivered from the office and even from like the programming department, it lets them stay in front of their machines more often, keep spindles turning, increase throughput and revenue. I saw one of our clients actually on the, uh, the attendee list right now, um, and I know that they, free, they, they, they improve their throughput on the shop floor about 20 to 25 percent just by having better information for their team to keep, uh, keep those spindles turning more often. So, and when we think about this, and actually, Brian, when we were prepping, you, you brought up this topic of thinking about uh, internal suppliers and customers. Um, so I, maybe you, you want to chime in a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, so when I think about the, the manufacturing process, especially if I'm on the shop floor, what I really want is I, I want a complete package of something to work on, right? That that's that's what I want. And and so the the people in front of me, whether it's a, a project manager, a planner, a programmer, uh, it could be somebody in procurement, they're my suppliers. That that's that's what is providing me with what I need to do my job. And just like any supplier for raw materials or hardware items or whatever it is, I want them to perform well and I want them to give me exactly those things that I need. And then my job is to provide inspection and shipping and uh, you know anyone else along the way with what they need. And ultimately, of course, the, the end customer. Um, so if we think about the entire value stream as sort of customers and suppliers, even internally, we start to change the way that those relationships work. And of course, if I'm gonna be building something for my end customer, I want it to be perfect. But if I'm gonna be building something for an internal customer, it really should be the same kind of thinking. I really want that information or that product or whatever it is to be perfect so they can go and do what they need to do without having any trouble on their part. So, so kind of changing the way we think about those things can be really helpful in terms of flowing information through and opening up those channels of communication. Yeah. And that flow of communication and good data builds trust. That's a really important point to kind of to hammer home. Um, and that trust and that good data is the foundation of making good decisions in, in the company overall. Um, whether you're, um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more, we'll get more into that. And Brian, I am gonna ask you when we get into the difference between paper and paperless, ask you a little bit about maybe some of your experiences working in other shops, or maybe that flow of communication wasn't as free and some yeah. of the things that you saw in those environments. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one thing I'd like to kind of kind of set the stage with is this idea of having a culture of 
of sharing, um, especially driven down by by owners and management. And um, this, I mean, ter in terms of like building connection and building trust and building uh, a team that feels, you know, like a family that they're all in it together. Um, a lot, it really, there, there's a huge amount of importance in, uh, in this, this idea of, of sharing and, and, and I'll take it all the way to, um, you know, financial and even open book type of concepts. Um, at our shop, we were pretty much totally open book every month. We had a, a, a full employee meeting. We shared our profits, our losses. We talked about, um, you know, you know, almost every, and there was nothing really off limits. Um, and uh, Brian, maybe you can speak from your own experience as well, having been in other companies that didn't do that and then how we did that. Um, yeah. Can you yeah. share maybe how, how that made you feel in terms of uh, being, you know, partnered up with, with everyone in the company? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really makes you feel like you're part of the company, not just, not just a cog, right. In the machinery, but, but really that, that, um, the success of the company is is really known. You know where we're going. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not sitting, <laughs> like if you want to use the analogy of, of sitting in a ship, right? You're not sitting in, in the bottom of a ship in, in some hold, not knowing where you're going, just feeling the waves. You're actually up on deck and you're seeing what's happening and you're seeing the storms coming and going and, mm -hmm. and the land coming up. And And as an employee, that's just a huge, uh, it's just a huge thing to be able to feel that and and really have confidence with what's happening. I think confidence is one of the things we don't talk a lot about mm, in terms yeah. of individual roles within a company. But if you have confidence in your team around you and you feel like the 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 entire company is a team, right from uh, owners and management all the way through the ranks, then it's just a much more productive environment. And when you're in a situation where that's not the case, there's an us and them. There's an over the mm -hmm. fence sort of an attitude. And that can tell you from personal experience, it just, it, you know, things are constantly late. Quality is poor. Nobody's happy. Thing, everybody's looking at the door either. <laughs> hey, I'm, you know, I'm off at two 30, I'm going home or man, I'm looking at the door for another opportunity where I can go somewhere else. And, and yeah, those, those are just really kind of um, demoralizing environments to be in for, for any length of time. So a really big difference, really, uh, uh, implications on 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 that kind of culture yeah thank you and also i wanted to kind of bring to light the you know as an owner as a manager of the company it's not like you you know you know everything and you're just delivering it down to the people doing work you know the people doing the work have a huge amount of information a huge amount of knowledge that they can contribute into the company to the to the to the betterment of everything so I just kind of want to introduce this idea of, you know, democratizing data, like having it be freely available for anyone to see and, and add to and contribute to. Because um, if you're not doing that, that's just a huge lost opportunity. There, there's a lot of information those folks have. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that, that um, I, I, as a supervisor, I was shared early on with one of my, my former bosses is that, you know, a good manager will surround him, him or herself with, with capable people instruct them on what to do and be available to answer any questions or to provide any data or any any other things that they need and just get the heck out of their way and let them do their jobs because that's mm -hmm. what they're there for right you got to trust yeah. that they're going to be able to do everything and part of that is providing them with all the information that they need speaking of trust um <laughs> this was actually a graphic that you found and yeah. brought up um yeah there's in in the companies that we talk to and see there's there's kind of kind of segregate them into two kind of different areas. One, companies where they trust data and, and that's a positive upward spiral and others where they don't trust it or they don't put in the effort to maintain it. Um, and it's really, you know, the systems that, that need to be built to, to build that trust have these distinct phases, right? Um, if you have uh, systems where people aren't actually working in them, they're sort of doing it sort of half-heartedly, um, then the data is irrelevant, people lose trust in it, then they decide to lose data less, they work around the system, um, and then that just, everything's just sort of breaking down and that, that communication layer is just, is lost or it's just chaotic or it's, you know, it's people running around, you know, asking people for information when they should be using the systems that the company has built. One, one really relevant example of this that I saw constantly 
me in uh, other shops was that uh, machinists would often have on their floppy disk. Yes, I'm saying floppy. I, I, <laughs> dating <laughs> yourself a bit. I'm dating myself a little bit. You know, they would have their floppy disk of a certain program for a certain part in their toolbox. And when that job came up again, they would go to their toolbox. They would oh, ignore wow. the program that was given to them. They'd go to the toolbox. They'd grab it because they they know they they made changes or whatever. They know that that program is good and it runs the way they expect it to. So they load it up. They run the job and they move on. And of course, the problem there is there's no revision control. There's no idea that that um, there could be a better and more efficient program. Um, there's just a, just a slew of opportunity for for waste in that in that whole concept. And yet, it was just standard. Like everybody did that. Everybody had a collection of floppies where they would have all of those things and and just a little notebook with what the different parts were. And and then of course, in the end you make a hundred parts and they're all the wrong revision because you didn't, <laughs> you know, you didn't get the right program oh, in there. And, and, you know, it's just, and it just, of course, snowballs and nobody wants to be in that situation. And, and so when I first saw this, I, I, that was the example that immediately came to mind because I just saw that over and over and over again. Yeah. One of our customers told us recently that they, uh, maybe not the floppies, but maybe, but they, each of their machinists would keep these little, like binders, you know, in their toolboxes as well with like job setup data, you know, mm -hmm. job information, like tool lists and other little notes that they've taken and they were in their toolboxes and the ones that, you know, the, the actual formal job traveler that used to come out onto the shop in paper format was just kind of ignored because they knew that that wasn't the real deal. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> what when they ran the job last, they took all their stuff and they stuck it in their toolbox. Yeah. And they actually got a finding, you know, on that from an auditor. So and right, rightfully so. Yeah. So yes, trust the data that will help build connection. Um, so we're gonna jump into and talk about the value stream in different, different phases. Uh, these phases you see here, um, starting from estimating and sales, all the way down through shipping jobs and getting client feedback. And, uh, and how the flow of information and what kind of information is really important to be sharing um, to uh, sort of achieve this goal of great, great open communication. So let's start with kind of the estimating and sales process, the front end, you know, most job shops uh, start getting work this way, right? And a customer says, hey, I need you to quote these things and uh, or requote these things possibly. Um, so in this case, the majority of the information that's being built is going to be flowing into the shop, although it is certainly important that the, uh, that the shop is flowing some things back up into the office for them to make better decisions. So uh, yeah, just going down the list here, um, making sure you're capturing all of the relevant information that the client wants, um, even if it's not on the drawing. Um, and because there's always this sort of, you know, shared information that, the, the, you know, the buyer says, hey, make sure that to do this or that, or this is going to be, you know, that uh, this is uh, the first, you know, of a, of a new contract order. Um, that's certainly relevant as, a pair, as opposed to, you know, a, a one-off job of, of 10 pieces. So uh, there's lots of stuff that the estimating department and sales team need to convey um, onto the shop later. Um, if you are, you know, mid process uh, of estimating and you need to know from the off from the shop, hey, you know, do we have the technical ability to make this part? Do we have capacity to make this part? Um, is this part we've made before? And if so, we need to see that prior job data um, to know if we did well, how the time went, what we spent on materials, any problems we ran across or maybe similar part numbers uh, as well. Um, and one of the main points that we're really trying to convey with all this is we want to set the shop up for success, right? We want uh, this sort of front end process to really flow data and information just seamlessly um, into the shop. Uh, and when this is done, it's remarkable how much it can help with avoiding mistakes and firefighting and spindle downtime. Um, it's just, yeah, just it can help an immense amount. Any thoughts on this one, Brian, before we jump to the next? No, actually, I have a few notes on the next uh, the coming slides here, so I'll, I'll All right. you know, hold my tongue till then. <laughs> All right. Next would be you win that job that you just quoted, and now you got to enter it, do contract review, and just kind of set everything up properly, right? Again, this is going to be majority flowing into the shop, but we definitely some back into the office. Um, 
Uh, so there's going to be contractual requirements that need to be flowed down, right? Whether it's um, whether it's quality notes that are you know, maybe on a workmanship document, maybe it's um, you know just the mill specs that need to be for the material for purchasing. You know, all these relevant pieces of information that need to get to everybody. You know, you got to be able to get that flowed se seamlessly to them. This is that uh, this is that in internal uh, customer and internal supplier relationship that we talked about earlier. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Um, so you want to pass along that that estimating data, right? What machines was it? What um, what resources? How much time? You know, all that's is gonna is gonna flow down. Um, and then of course of you know providing the very latest copy of the drawing, the latest copy of any any reference documents. Um, and then again, all this is, is, is there to set up the shop for success. Um, and if you, oftentimes when we're in a more detailed contract review process, um, this is the time to possibly catch some mistakes that weren't, weren't seen at, at estimating. So maybe there is some little nuance when you get into the more detailed um, review process that you're like, hey, you know, there's a red flag here. We need to, um, we, we might have some trouble with this. Um, so we need to flow that back upstream and resolve that with a client. So there's, there's definitely information that's going to, going to go both ways. Yeah. And very often between estimating and, and, uh, order entry, you know, it, it's not uncommon to, for the estimating team to be given a preliminary drawing, but you mm -hmm. can't, you can't really push a preliminary drawing into, into, uh, project management and into programming. You really need to know what are the final revs. And that's going to be one of those roles that, that, you know, as as they go through and they input the information and it's going to get further into the system, they need to make sure at order entry that they have the right revision information to push that through. So that's a really kind of another common example of things that we see in estimating. Hey, this is a brand new product. I, I don't have the final drawing yet. Go ahead and estimate it right away. And then we'll mm -hmm. deal with any of the, the, the small changes uh, along the way. So that's why one of the reasons that contract review is so important. Yep. Yeah. So in this phase of the project, right, we've accepted it, um, and now we're kind of getting deep into the weeds here. So um, the way we think about this, the project planners and programmers, they're taking what was estimated and they're adding more meat to the bones, right? They're coming up with a super detailed plan, making any revisions. You know, maybe there's an additional operation that's needed for this side hole. Maybe um, they thought about a different way to make it. So they're putting in, you know, more, more, more information there. This is also where they're going to be generating work instructions, right? The, the, the programming department, they're going to, you know, maybe grab some screen captures out of their cam system, exactly how you're holding it, where the zeros are, what tools are needed, um, refining the time budget. So if the estimating department said, you know, I think this is a two hour setup and the, and the programmers say, you know what, we figured out a way to do this super quick. I bet think we can get this done in, in, in an hour, hour and a half, right? They can refine those targets. Um, and that uh, will just make it more accurate, which again, builds that trust. Um, inspection planning should happen at this point. So developing a detailed inspection plan, all the procurement stuff that was flowed down from originally from estimating should be firmed up, confirmed, and then feed that into procurement. So, you know, raw materials, special tools, um, anything, bomb items, hardware that can, can, get, can get procured. And, uh, and again, we're, we're doing all this to, make sure that the people that are really the, 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 val the main value adders in our company, you know, those machinists, those setup people, those, those folks that are taking the raw material and turn into finished goods, they have everything that they need. And um, what's still feeding back up into the office at this point is, you know, maybe, um, uh, you know, the schedules of course are incredibly dynamic. Um, so maybe, uh, there's information about, Hey, we, you know, this machine is now full, you know, two days ago it was open, but now it's full. So we need to, you know, we may not have capacity in this machine. We need to adjust the plan, um, and maybe do it on a different machine or whatever. So uh, there's yeah, definitely I, stuff that's going to feed back. Yeah. And I, I, you know, um, the, the, the right side of the slides for the last three slides has been pretty close to the same, you know, the two offices have been pretty low, 10%. Um, and what we, you know, one of the reasons here is that when we think about what happens on the shop floor, when we think about the machinists that are out standing in front of the machines, you know, their job is complex enough to, 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 to put together all of those moving parts and make sure that we're not scrapping uh, one, you know, scrapping material, two, scrapping tools, three, fixtures, four, the actual machine and crashing and, and having, you know, big instances. Those, those are, 
they're really, really complex things. So we want to make sure that they don't have to guess about all of this other thing, all of the, the other data that should be coming from estimating and, and contract review and project management and planning. You know, all of those things, if, if that information, going back to the trust thing, if they trust that, that information is good, they're going to be able to focus on that really important part of actually putting all of those little bits together, putting the jigsaw puzzle together and making sure that all those pieces fit and they're not just, you know, just shooting from the hip and, and, and uh, uh, you know, trying to make decisions on the fly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so now we're into production and it, the, 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 there's a lot bigger flow from, from the office back up into the shop. Uh, but there's obviously still stuff going both ways. So on the, on the office side, right, you need to um, make sure that any changes that's pertinent to production get, get instantly transferred through the shop, right? A customer calls with a due date change, that should be, you know, that should be updated everywhere instantly. You know, it's, it's um, when we get into the talking about paper, you know, the, the, the problems with paper travelers and paper based systems is there's always information out there that is, or there's very often information that is obsolete um, and that just causes problems and mistakes and uh, scrap and, and all sorts of bad stuff. So, but what's coming um, again from the shop into the office is, uh, you know, feedback on what that plan was, how it's going, what that job status is currently, you know, where, and some, some of this is data that's going to be pushed by the shop folks. And some of it is going to be data that's just collected by the nature of someone doing their job that the office just take a look and see what's going on. Um, if there's, uh, if there's non-conformance reports or scrap, uh, that needs to be brought up and talked about right away. You know, that might mean you need to order more material or maybe make an adjustment to, to a program or a plan or a tool, right? And that flow of information has to be quick uh, in order for it to not snowball into a bigger problem. Um, of course, the, the, the shop, the office always wants to know, you know, how many parts are made, where are they at? So they can answer those questions from, uh, from the customer to provide that sort of status updates for customers. Um, and then lastly here, problems that have been found and process changes, those kind of go hand in hand. We'll talk a little bit more about that in detail later, but, um, this again, kind of like I mentioned earlier, you know, the shop floor workers are just a wealth of information and knowledge and providing them with tools to capture those, the, that feedback, that information that needs to be flowed back up for quoting better next time or improving the process or making changes to the program are all things that, uh, are really important. And we're going to pause for a second to talk a little bit about time tracking. Time tracking is uh, obviously a part of the production environment, um, but it's really, really important. And I wrote a blog about this recently, so I wanted to put this slide in here um, about just how important this is um, for information flow both directions, right? So pretty much everything a shop does um, largely comes down to time, right? Time, labor is the biggest cost in almost every in almost every shop. So how much time people are spending on doing different types of activities is just really, really important for um, making good decisions about what to do with specific jobs or the company overall. Uh, there's just so much rich information in that data um, that uh, it's just essential. And, you know, some companies do this really well um, and have a good culture of time tracking. There's they've done a good job upstream of building trust so that they know that um, that the employees know that that data is going to be used well. They're not going to use it as a stick. It's more of a carrot, right? If you track time, we will be able to make better decisions as a company, make more profit, pay you more, have better you know, benefits, and just all the good things that go with uh, better data. I see you smiling and laughing there, Brian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, because it, 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 it... Uh, what, that's one of the things that I've, I've talked to when training other companies is, is that, you know, people feel like, oh, they're, they're, they're really putting me under the microscope here. And, and the answer to that is, you know, that just what you said, that's not the case at all, right? The, the case is we really can't make good decisions unless we know what's happening. And the only way we're going to know what's happening is if everyone is open with the, the information and, and, and recording what they're doing, because that's really going to give us the picture of how all of that works. Uh, and it's it, it, the other part about this, that I, I don't know if you were about to say this, but it, it should be easy. Also, we don't want to burden our employees oh, with, 
you know, okay, now I'm going to have you do this extra bit. Uh, so, you, you know, that's just going to add one more thing. So, so really fitting in the tracking of your time and, and progress should be easy, right? The, the, you know, right. just that should be just a standard part of the day, it takes a few seconds, and then that's it. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, our goal is not to put someone under a microscope. Unfortunately, there are companies that do that, right? <laughs> um, so I was talking to some guys uh, on a clubhouse recently, and we were talking about time tracking. And, you know, they brought up the good point. They're like, in some of the shops we've worked in, it's absolutely a stick, right? You, 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 something takes too long. And, you know, the owner is like right there, you know, uh, hounding you for taking too long and working, you know, work faster, work harder. Um, and unfortunately, that's just not the approach that's going to work uh, for long-term success. Right, right. But it does happen. But that's, we're trying to, trying to eliminate that. All right, so final QA and fulfillment, like we're done with the job, we're done making it at least. Um, and there's a lot of information that needs to flow both directions here. It's really, you know, it can be a dynamic, uh, crucial time. Um, so we, we wanna, from the, from the office side, we wanna make sure that everyone out in the shop that's doing shipping and paperwork prep and QA all have the, the information that they need to make, uh, the right, the right decisions or just do their job right, right? Where is it going? How is it supposed to be packaged? What paperwork is needed? Um, uh, you know, anything that's just sort of logistical stuff, right? You shouldn't have people running around asking, hey, where, you know, does this ship to, you know, the, to their warehouse or does it ship to their main location? Um, uh, so that should be super abundantly clear. When uh, the shipment actually arrives at the customer's site uh, and they may provide feedback, this is crucial that the shop, that the office ca gather that feedback and feed it back into a way that the shop can, can make use of that in the future. So we'll talk more about that later. Um, and then from the shop side, right, they're providing um, sort of the details of what, what actually got produced, right? How many parts actually made it all the way through? Um, do we have extras? Are we short? Are we exact? Um, ultimately, that'll feed, you know, job costing information, which of course is immensely crucial. Right. If companies don't know which jobs are profitable or not, they can't make good decisions about um, about that. Um, and then they're going to help prepare the document packages for delivering to the client. Um, and then ultimately as well, shipping details, you know, how it shipped, when it shipped. So clients can get that status from people in the office that need to provide that to them. All right. So that's kind of the value stream portion of things. Um, this may be a little bit redundant at this point, um, but uh, again, this is really about the free flow of information, uh, making sure that if, you know, as, as we mentioned before, you know, job shops are incredibly dynamic environment. There's always things changing. Um, so having uh, a really free flow of information in both directions is, is just so crucial. Um, you know, customers are demanding. They want to know, hey, where, where are my parts? Uh, when am I going to get them? Um, and being able to provide, you know, that information right away, not have to call someone back the next day or later in the day or email them a status, you know, be able to provide them instant information uh, is just so important. And the only way to do that is having a good flow of communication back and forth. Um, so, uh, again, one of the ways that we believe this is uh, best solved is by having everything be digital and getting rid of paper, right? Um, and we talked earlier about, I mentioned, you know, a, uh, uh, a um, you know, paper, paper job travelers, paper routers are very likely to be, to be um, obsolete if chain, things are changing, due dates are changing, revs are changing, quantities are changing. Um, there's just not going to be the most up-to-date information. So going paperless is a great way to do that. It also helps people um, parallel process, right? Um, so when a, when a job gets gets entered, uh, if, if there's no paper document that's flowing around and sitting on, you know, a project manager's desk and then procurement and then the programmer and then finally out into the shop, if that's not happening, happening, then people can parallel process and do a lot more things right away, which will, uh, again, sort of open up that, that information flow, make sure people have the time to make the right decisions. So you're not sending a job, you know, packet to the programmer like the day before they need to program it. Uh, and then they realize they need a custom ground tool that they can't get overnight. Um, so this is the kind of thing that happens all the time uh, when you don't have that good flow of information. Yep, digital 
drivers also can't get lost. Um, there's definitely not information traveling if it's lost. <laughs> um, easier <laughs> yeah. to split jobs, of course, uh, and everything is all in one place. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about some of the pain points. Um, again, maybe this is redundant, but um, but uh, worth worth kind of hammering home here. Um, so with a with a shop that doesn't have really good systems for opening up that flow of communication, right? Things are things are jobs are getting stuck. The, the, the rev has changed, but people in the shop didn't realize that, so they keep making the wrong parts. Um, you're searching for travelers, you're searching for uh, things that um, just just aren't where they're supposed to be. Again, that that uh, obsolete information, uh, like you mentioned, Brian, with the uh, with the the floppy disk, there's there's implicit knowledge that some people know and other people don't know, right? Mm -hmm. um, which uh, and then there's often transcript, you know, a lot of data entry stuff, right? So if someone is maybe tracking time on paper cards, um, then someone else is taking those paper cards and then entering them into a system later, which has, you know, not only just uh, time that shouldn't need to be spent, but you could get it wrong. And it's also going to be late, right? So maybe um, a job is going over time budget, but no one can see that because it's just written on paper. Whereas if it was digital and everyone can see exactly how much time had been spent so far versus the time budget, you can make adjustments and uh, you know and and pivot and make some make some improvements there. Mm -hmm. um, so when when there is a better flow of information, obviously decision making is easier. Uh, auditing is incredibly uh, easier, um, and that actually feeds not only you know like auditors from like ISO or AS, but you know customer auditors, giving them a lot better confidence that this company has their act together and uh, we want to do business with them. So, and then there's just reduction of costs, obviously shorter lead times, things are faster uh, and all the other good stuff we've already mentioned. So let's get into and talking about how ProShop can help uh, with a lot of these different aspects. Um, so obviously ProShop is a fully paperless system. That's something that we just feel so strongly about. Um, you know, this is 2021 and so many and other industries are completely digital, pretty modern, but yet so many shops just cling to those paper job travelers, which uh, which causes a lot of wastes. So starting at the beginning of the process, um, and we're gonna kind of flow through all the way to the end here. Uh, so that estimating process, right? There's a few points here that I wanted to make. Um, first of all, having it be accurate and having it be, um, uh, but fast as well, like and specific information that the shop really needs to know, like how much have they have they planned, you know, for cycle times, for run times, for setup times, um, even you know additional non-recurring time that could be for making fixtures or proving out programs, right? That's that's important information for people to know out on the shop floor. And then all that information can will be brought forward, so you know that. That information that we're using to, ge to, to generate pricing data is then used to generate schedules and targets and Absolutely. You know, just everything that you need along the way. You enter it once and then it just pushes forward. Yep. We talked earlier about uh, capturing and communicating information that's not clearly evident on the drawing, right? Um, so here's an example of what we call, we call process development. Um, where you know someone in sales or estimating can put in a few notes here, the things that they noticed or they talked to you know about the buyer or the engineer that they're working with, whatever that uh, that really need to be flowed down. And if they don't get flowed down, those are the gotchas, right? Those are the things that um, you know when the programmer gets a job, you know a job packet the day before it's supposed to go on the machine, and they realize there's this custom ground tool they need, right? That that could have been that could have been prevented with better better communication up front. So we want to do that kind of stuff. And this this process development, we'll talk about it even a little later because it flows through the entire process from estimating all the way through the office and then back even into customer feedback. So uh, communication messaging. So ProShop has a, an internal messaging system where you can you know right from any page you can just click to make a new message. It, uh, you can then grab uh, and just click in different groups of people um, and that will fill that in and you can send them a note. And then that will also include a hyperlink, assuming you don't uncheck this box, it'll automatically include a hyperlink to the page that you are on. So if you're like, hey, this, you, you guys need to know about this thing, 
um, or work on this job, or you know, I need this tool or this bomb item or whatever it might be. I need some clarification on this work instruction, right? So someone receiving that message can just click on it and instantly they know exactly what you're talking about. So, and there's you a, know, there's a uh, yeah. sorry, there's a there's a number of uh, auto generated messages too to just keep people in the know, right? If there's a revision or a date change or a quantity change, you know, uh, or any uh, any other number of different um, uh, factors that can change in the process. The project managers, planners, and, and the appropriate people will get an automated message. So it doesn't have to be if a if a customer service person puts in a date change, they don't have to manually go and tell somebody else or even send them a message. The system is actually just going to do that for them. Yep. Yeah. Great point. And obviously, if you don't have a system like this, you know, you can use Slack or Microsoft Teams or some other little chat client. But um, those are just inherently have problems if they're not sort of natively connected into your your information system and all your data so uh contract review is kind of next right so we've won that job um again we want to flow down all those contractual requirements we want to make sure we that everyone knows like which part they need to go work on so again pro shop will send one of those automated messages like you mentioned brian um and so people in you know in planning and scheduling and accounting uh, and quality can immediately get notified. They can come do their part of the process, sign off that they've done it, uh, and everyone can see exactly what's going on, as opposed to something sitting on someone's desk, waiting for someone, one person to do it, uh, and everyone else doesn't even know there's a job yet. Uh, this is a uh, this is a good, uh, very useful tool. <laughs> this is called the pre-processing checklist. It's a fully configurable checklist system that um, allows you to even customize different types of checklists and requirement action items based on the type of job you're performing. So maybe it's a prototype job or a brand new you know, production job that uh, needs to be well documented and well planned out. Maybe it's a repeat order at the same rev that you've done 20 times before. Um, so the requirements of what needs to be done obviously changes in those situations. And this list will um, be available for people to you know, do their thing, have other people be able to see what's been done so far. You'll also notice these color codes, the pink section, the orange, the yellow, the green, the gray, um, and the status of which, which sections have been completed will be flowed automatically into other things. So if we look at like the schedule, for example, um, this is another important piece of information that, uh, that the shop needs to know. And then the office needs to also look back to see how the job is going, right? This, this job that's at the top here is telling us exactly how many hours are remaining uh, overlaid onto our shift schedule, right? So we can see for the next, you know, these white spaces, for example, is when we don't have a shift scheduled, um, but this little green sliver, right? This job has a, a couple hours of, of time that's gonna be done on Tuesday morning. And then this one right here that I've circled, right? See the background color of those bars is pink. That actually corresponds back to this section, which means only this section has been completed. We haven't yet done our quality planning. We haven't yet finished our programming process or reviewing the program on a repeat order. So um, someone in planning or you know procurement or whatever can easily you know go and see exactly what's going on. Um, and uh, do the things they need to do to make sure that's that everything's dialed in nicely. And if you do have a job that's supposed to go on the machine tomorrow morning and you don't have it programmed and you don't have a quality plan yet, that's a problem, right? You need to solve that problem. We need to put people on it right away. Right. right. Um, uh, time targets are of course incredibly important. Everyone wants to know how, long, how much time do I have? What is, what is this supposed to take? And again, coming back to the trust thing, they have to be accurate. You can't give them, um, you know, woefully inadequate time targets. So we got to, you know, let them see how much time there is, both recurring and non-reoccurring, right? If you have those first-time jobs that have, it's a need some extra time for a fixture or for prove out. Um, and we also want to be able to see things like, you know, first articles and, and you know, are those done yet? So everyone, again, has those statuses that they can see to make good decisions and give clients feedback. Instructions, work instructions are incredibly important here. Um, so obviously we have the ability to embed, you know, text, photos, videos. Um, and uh, again, that generally will start in the office with things like, you know, screen grabs 
and just some notes out of the cam system. Um, and then ultimately that'll turn into actual photos and videos and, and what's actually happening on the shop floor. And that combined set of data just is incredibly rich, you know, information that, um, that both sides of the equation needs. Um, I see there's a question coming uh, yeah, from, I'll, yeah, I'll, uh, you'll get I'll, that one. I'll get them, yeah. uh, tool lists also, there's so many important things about tools in a machine shop, obviously. Um, this can also be used for other types of tools, but in this case, we're talking about machining processes. Uh, you know, what are the tools that are needed? And, um, you know, specifically which part numbers? We, we are big advocates of going to uh, a part number based uh, tool system as opposed to just general descriptions. Um, so providing what the programmer intended, uh, you know, with what type of tool and what kind of holder sticking out, how far, you know, what kind of tool life. This is important for both what the, sh what the shop floor needs to get those jobs properly kitted and prepped. And then like this tool usage over here on the far right, that's incredibly important to procurement, right? Because they know if you are doing an order of, you know, 500 parts and you only get, you know, 40 parts out of a tool, you know, you're going to need a, a dozen or more of those tools, right? And we need to know that in advance. Uh, so procurement can make sure that we have all the tools we need and we're not going to run out mid job or go to set up a job and realize we don't have something that we need. So this is a place where, you know, I'd say programming, obviously still kind of an office slash shop position where information is going both directions. And it's really crucial that that happen. Uh, inspection plans. We've talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, you know, if, if you're not making good parts, you're not really making anything. So knowing what needs to be inspected, right? So the quality department is determining maybe probably in conjunction with the programmer, you know, which, which tools are being cut. What do we need to check in process? What do we need to do on our first article? And then the shop floor folks, the, the machinists, the inspectors, they're capturing that data. They're putting it in so everyone, everyone can see it. Uh, you can monitor trends and, uh, and, um, so yeah, good stuff there. Important stuff there. Uh, Nonconformances do happen, right? So when we're uh, when we're measuring those parts, if we have something that is uh, that is out of tolerance, Pro Shop. Now back on this last slide, there's nothing here that's out of tolerance. The green ones are right in the middle. The yellow, these yellow ones here are a little bit close to the limit, but nothing is bad. If we put in a, a bad value into one of these, you know, fields here on the right. ProShop would instantly pop up a warning saying this is this is out of tolerance. You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to make a nonconformance report or was that a typo? So if we make a nonconformance report, um, that again instantly creates that automatic alert that Brian you talked about earlier, right? So people, a uh, quality manager can see that, uh, you know, a project manager, um, so a shift lead, right? Those kind of folks can see what's happening and come provide support or help uh, mitigate the problem. Yeah, there's another another sort of uh, facet to this, and that is that uh, you know we we talk with a lot of companies that have a full QMS, a you know AS or ISO, and they collect nonconformance data because they have to uh, as part of their system, uh, and you know some some even go to the level of of compiling that data and collating it and 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 trying to see well we've had this much scrap or whatever. Uh, but very often it's a lot of work because it's very a manual process, just like collating time tracking uh, from from paper systems. Um, and so one of the things that happens is they may not actually invest the time that they need to, ag to, to get real data to actually, you know, affect change throughout the system. And with ProShop, when you create a nonconformance, the, both the NCR code and the cause codes, the, by the way, those are customizable, so you can you can create whatever codes you want. But you know, you'll actually just with a couple seconds, they they fill in what happened and what how did it happen, and then when you run your monthly report, which is literally a click of a button, it includes those, and then you can sort and you can see well, you know, this job had cutting tool failures five times, or there was a programming error, or there was a setup error, or whatever the factor may be, and and you've then instantly got data about what happened and why did it happen. So you can actually work on improving that rather than just collecting the data because the QMS says to, you're actually able to use it and do what is intended for, for the reason that the QMS wants you to track it in the first place. So, mm -hmm. so trying to bridge that gap is, is, is a huge opportunity for most companies and ProShop can do it in a way that really reduces the amount of time required to get all that information. <clears throat> yeah, the most common number that I hear about 
the time that's saved by like typically a quality manager is 50%. That is the number I've heard time and time again from many different clients. Their QA managers are saving 50% of their time um, doing clerical work, doing administrative work that they can now dedicate those that time and effort to doing process improvement activities, you know, seeing, you know, what is the cause, the main cause of our scrap, you know, month to date, year to date um, for this part number, for this client, right? So there's just so much rich information that you can, uh, you can action on when it doesn't take as much time. Uh, job status, right? Where is the job at? Um, clients always are asking this. They want to know, you know, when can I get my parts? Um, and uh, having a real time, you know, job traveler like this, you know, a digital work order where you can see exactly what's been done, you know, how many parts are done through which operations have been queued to work at next. So, um, you know, this kind of uh, sort of live status, you know, you could even check this from your phone or a tablet, you know, you're a salesperson's out visiting a client and, uh, and the client says, hey, you know, we just, you know, this job just got really hot, you know, um, what can you guys do for me, right? The salesperson, I used to do this at our shop, I'd pull up my iPhone and I'd be like, yeah, see, here's, the, here's where your job is at. It just finished the machining, it's going through deburr right now, right? We'll get it out to anodize this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, and then maybe I could even send a message straight from there into, you know, procurement and say, hey, you know, the customer needs an expedite on this, right? So um, getting, again, that information directly from the client straight into the people that need to take action um, is just so, so, so important. Uh, time tracking, we talked about that earlier, just how important that is. Um, ProShop has a, a really fast and easy way to track time. Um, and one of the important notes is that you can also have have notes about this, right? People can type a little note about what happened during their setup or what happened while they were running. Um, and that's just really crucial information that the office needs uh, for estimating and, and, and making decisions about jobs and, and looking at profitability and things of that sort. And then process development, we talked about this a little bit earlier, right? It started with this, uh, this note from the estimating department, but later on, um, while it's in process, uh, you know, machinists or operators or, or people can, can capture notes about things, problems they see, opportunities for improvement. Uh, they can click to send a message instantly to the planner. So if it's more urgent, so they get that notice right away and they can take action on it. So really, really useful tool. Um, and then we're getting close to the end here. So we're, na we're now in that sort of final shipping prep fulfillment step of the process, right? So all the quality requirements uh, and paperwork requirements can be flowed down, you know, including do they need certs and first article reports and what format and all those other things can flow down really seamlessly. And they will be actually displayed right in the shipping operations and, and, and uh, final inspection operations. And they'll even automatically sort of help prep the document packages for this. Once that's all prepped, then you're actually ready to ship the parts, uh, right? This, this kind of information is captured for each client. Uh, just like that paperwork uh, section. This is all on the same page, just different little snippets. So this is the shipping requirements, right? This customer prefers us to use UPS. They're okay if we ship, uh, you know, plus or minus 10% from the exact order quantity. This is the on-time delivery window. You know, don't ever package with peanuts um, and uh, these other details that uh, are really important. And again, these will flow immediately into shipping operations, into packing slips so people can make good decisions without having to go search it out. And then ultimately, right, you finish your job, everything's done, you wanna see how you did on it. Um, ProShop's job costing is, I'd call it second to none, right? It's, it's pretty much automatic as people capture time, as they track time, as people in procurement are buying things, that feeds directly into the job costing. And you can just click on a single, single link, assuming you have, you have uh, permission to do so. Uh, and see exactly where you did, where you where you spent your money, uh, what you know profit or loss you made, and then any of these things in blue are sort of drillable hyperlinks where you can just click in. All right, I'm going to go see exactly what labor was spent. That'll take you to a time tracking query. Uh, the, the the cost of goods for purchased items will take you right to a purchasing query for exactly what was purchased on that job. So really easy to uh, to kind of do that research and homework. And then final, um, this is also process development, but zoomed way in here. Um, great for recording and incorporating 
client feedback, right? So we've shipped this job to the client. Um, you know, technically it was per drawing, but they ask us, you know, hey, can you please kind of lighten up on the deburr um, just for whatever reason? You know, we don't want to change the drawing, but we really want the deburr to be less or any other kind of feedback, packaging feedback, anything else. So someone in customer service or sales can capture that item, just put it in at the part number level, and then automatically, the next time you get a job, well, I mean, if you click this message, click this button, the message will get sent to the to the planner. But if you don't check, click that button, um, or even if you do, the next time the, the part gets ordered again, it will pop up uh, with a proactive warning that there are outstanding process development items that need to be incorporated in or, or resolved. And until that workflow is taken all the way through to resolution, it will keep popping up this notice. So people can you know, make sure to maybe change the program so that edge break is lighter, or just put a little flag note on the drawing to make sure that uh, machinists aren't uh, getting too crazy with that burr whip so anyway so that is kind of how ProShop helps um, you know we really again coming back to that idea of democratizing that data trying to solve all these communication gaps you know that's I guess that's a, that's a theme you know we've really tried to do that over the years it was important in our shop right Brian and folks on the shop floor were we're giving feedback about jobs, um, and it was important that we we have quick and easy ways for them to communicate that. Any final thoughts on that, Brian? Yeah, no, I think that that um, you know we could talk about this for hours on end, right? <laughs> um, and in fact, I'd love to, right? If if anyone has any questions or they want to kind of uh, uh, you know just talk about the challenges they see in their shop, we you know we've seen a ton of it, we've we've lived it, um, and. We have solutions for for so many different things that that uh, having a good conversation um, would be would be great. I, I, I'd love to to spend some time with anyone that that uh, that wants to. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so there were a couple of questions that Brian answered just through the chat. Um, if there's anything else right now, feel free to pop it up here. Yeah. Um, while we're like, waiting. Yeah, oh yeah. We got one. Um, so do people need to use a computer or can they use an iPad? So, yeah, uh, that's a, that's any, a any anything with a browser. Yeah, yeah anything yeah. with a browser. So um, whether it's an iPhone, an iPad, a tablet, an Android, you know, a full PC with three monitors, right? Uh, it's just a browser. So um, if you have a browser on your device, and we don't have any apps because the browser functionality kind of handles that. But um, but yeah, any kind of device that has uh, internet connection, or if you're doing so, we have a few clients that do on-premise. Um, and uh, and in those cases, they're still just using the browser, but they're not relying on an internet connection. They're just browsing their local internal network. Yeah, yeah. Great question. Um, and while we're waiting for any others to come in, um, uh, our next webinar is coming up in about a month. Um, super excited for this one. I'm actually flying to North Carolina for this. We did a similar one last fall, and uh, and Emily just put in the ch in the link there or in the chat, she put the link to register for this. So Roush Yates engines, they make all the, the Ford NASCAR engines and a bunch of other race engines. Um, they also have a, a pretty large contract manufacturing component of their company. Um, just an incredibly beautiful, impressive shop. You could literally eat off the floors. It's spotless. Uh, looks like a museum almost. Um, we'll be doing a live tour, walking through their shop with a, with a video camera. Um, looking at their shop and looking at how they use ProShop. It's really helped dramatically improve um, uh, so many things in their company. And in fact, um, Jennifer here on the right hand side, she used to be their quality manager. Um, she's now their production manager. And she was one of the ones that told us she saved about 50% of her time um, every day. So she uh, anyway, so that'll be a great one. Yeah, please do register for that. Um, so that yeah, actually, we're going to have a recording. Um, yeah, that'll be recorded. So register, you'll get the recording out if you can't actually make it. But, uh, and then that's it. Thank you so much. Um, there is, I see one other question that has come in here. Uh, to help shops bridge from paperless, is there a way to add RFID tracking to ProShop system? Uh, it's a great question, Charles. Um, not yet, um, but with our new API that's just being released and developed, um, that's gonna open up just a world of possibilities for doing things like that. And uh, we're very, very excited about uh, some of the future prospects with uh, doing that kind of thing.
And one more question about um, if we if we serve in India, um, and if not, what, what is our future plan? Yeah, um, we don't yet have any clients in India. Um, we're certainly not opposed to it. Um, the time zone uh, issue is probably some of the biggest factors, uh, right? We, all of our support and, and team training and everything is is largely on the west coast of the U.S. Um, so it just makes it tough to uh, to train and provide support when it's the middle of the night for us and India's you know has their business day. So um, we may have some options coming out uh, to uh, have a broader you know reach of time zones from different geographic regions of the world. So uh, definitely don't rule it out. Um, but currently we don't have any clients at the moment, but certainly open to it. So all right, well that is top of the hour. Um, that time that timing worked out great. Brian, thank you so much for all of your input. Uh, well, I always you. love your perspective, so thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. And please join us for the Roush Yates tour in a month. And, uh, and don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions about ProShop. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everybody.